Hello, puppies and kittens. Um, I have somebody, I know someone, you know, close who uh, was recently hospitalized. And, you know, the expectations initially were, you know, that this person is sick and they're going to go into the hospital. And it, they expected that it would be a few days, maybe, maybe, you know, a couple of days. And then, but, uh, and then when it turned out to be a little bit longer than that, okay, well, she'll be in, she'll be in the hospital a week or so and maybe two or three days in a rehab to, you know, get a little bit of exercise in, get walking good again, and then, you know, be back as good as, as good as new. Um, well, that was a month ago and, uh, still in the hospital or still in a rehab, uh, two weeks in the hospital, two weeks in a rehab. Don't know where that's going. Don't know what our expectations are at this moment, but I'm thinking about people who face these kinds of things where there's a possibility that, that, that she's going to always be in some kind of assisted living kind of thing from here on, just period. And when people deal with this new reality, you know, where somebody's up, you know, independent, walking around, you know, doing the housework or whatever, and able to drive around town and all that sort of thing. And then, and then suddenly they can't sit up or, or get out of bed on their own. I mean, quite abruptly and like, will never walk again just because of some illness. And now you're looking at this reality. You, you think about you know, people you find themselves in a kind of you know, desperate situation about trying to think about what options are and anything like that. And and imagine that somebody comes in and starts talking to you, trying to console you know, you know your worries by telling you that something that sounds like they like they have a good friend who's like ex has seemingly unlimited resources is like they're a they're talking about a multi-billionaire oligarch or something that they just happen to be friends with this person who could just write a check and solve all your problems. Don't worry about it. You know, I'll, I'll ask my friend to help you out. And then you find out that that friend is just pretend, you know, how do you react to that? You know, I mean, the, the way I think people would normally react, you, you build up somebody's hopes. Yeah. I've got this powerful friend who'll be able to help out your situation, whatever it is. And then you find out that, that friend is basically imaginary. Uh, I think most people would be outraged unless of course it's God, because what's the difference, you know, uh, to, to give you an idea. Uh, many years ago, I had a granddaughter well over a decade ago. I, I had a granddaughter who, who uh, was diagnosed with leukemia, like at four months old, or she got leukemia at four months old and she ended up going into children's hospital for treatment. Of course, we're all very scared about that sort of thing. And then, and then she's cured effectively. And then some months later, almost a year later, she goes back into the hospital. There's a relapse, something prompted a relapse and she's got leukemia again. And of course your, your chances of surviving a second round of that is uh, it diminished to say the best. And then they, they cured her again, you know, and it was much rejoicing and all of that. And then a year or so later, there's another relapse brought on by some other condition that was a result of the chemo and all of that. And so now she's back in the hospital again. And of course, the, 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 the odds of survival are much reduced to the point of now not being realistic, you know, so that um, that's just kind of the attitude that the, the staff is giving you, very professional and all of that. But I mean, being realistic, they're like, yeah, there's, there's very little chance anymore. Now, in cases like that, I'm of a mind that real world problems require real world so, you know, solutions. And I need reality based answers. Uh, so what doesn't work for me is like a, a friend of mine, uh, you know, somebody that I worked with back then, uh, who's a genuinely good hearted guy. I mean, he's, he's sincere, pure of heart. I know that he actually has genuine compassion for people. And and when he, he realizes how grave the situation is, you know, he, he puts a hand on my shoulder, you know, consolingly with a, with, with a, a serious face. He says, I'll pray for you. As if that fucking means anything. So not having patience for that kind of shit. I remember asking him, I said, imagine that you've got a, a terrible issue that you have to deal with. I mean, it could cost you your house. It could cost you your job. You're just, you know, you've got a terrible issue that you, you, you're worried about morning, noon, and night. And some four-year-old child comes up to you and says, 
that she's going to write a letter to Santa that you get the solution to your problem. I asked him, I said, that little girl earnestly believes there's a Santa and that she's going to write him. And, you know, that, that is, does it make you feel better? Does it ease you at all to know that she's going to write a letter to Santa on your behalf? No, it doesn't. Funny. Now imagine that that four-year-old girl is a 40-year-old fucking man who says exactly the same shit, except that it's not Santa Claus, of course. It's God. Effectively the same fucking thing. So... I get it. it. This is just how I have to react to this. You know, there, there comes a time when that shit doesn't work. As a matter of fact, that uh, my, my my granddaughter, of course, didn't make the the second relapse. And then some years later, that you know, that that hospital, Children's Hospital in Dallas, uh, have wanted to have their 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 hospital chaplains wanted to meet with representatives of the atheist community. A strange invitation. And it was, it was, they reached out to two other people that were more well known in the local community than I am. And I, almost as a, as an afterthought, one of them thought to invite me and then the other two guys couldn't show up. And so for whatever happened, fortuitously, I end up being the only one there. I'm in a room full of hospital chaplains. I want to say there was like 10 of them and me. And what they wanted to know was, they said they have, you know, because, you know, atheism is on the rise everywhere and, and religion is in a general state of decline in this country. So they, what they've noticed is that uh, the, the things they would say to believers when they're, when they're facing the death of a child or when they're thinking, when they're facing you know, impossible circumstances and they have the way that, they're, you know, that people have to deal with this, they've noticed that the things that would make believers give you know it, it, it would believers would find comfort in the kinds of things that you would say to such people that they would appreciate not only don't work on atheist it actually angers atheists and the chaplains are confused about why when they say things like well you know god just needed another angel or some such shit like that yeah it, atheist parents get pissed off and I find it amazing that the chaplains don't understand this. I had to explain to a room full of chaplains how when you say things are true that you can't know to be true and that are evidently not true, you're just it sounds like you're just making up statistics out of your ass. You are effectively lying. Yeah, you believe it. You don't know that you're lying. You're pretending to know things you don't know and you're you're asserting baseless assumptions as if it's a matter of fact, that's lying. Saying something is true or the truth when there is no truth that you can show, that's a lie. And so this is the way we interpret that. And so I have to explain to these people, why is it? Why does it piss atheists off? We want real answers. Don't give me some bullshit. Don't make shit up and pretend like you know what you're talking about. And so these chaplains asked me, they were they were at a loss. They said, "Well, what what do we say to people then, to make them feel better? If if we say any of the things that, that we commonly say to Christians, you know, and that just enrages the atheist, well, what can we say to the atheist that'll make them feel better?" And I says, "Don't lie to us." And this is the the big challenge that you've got as a chaplain dealing with an atheist. All we want is your humanity. We don't care about, we do not share the bullshit. Do not tell us anything about God or angels or any devils or any of that magical hocus pocus shit. Cause that's exactly how we're going to react. You know, I didn't, when my, when my friend put his hand on my shoulder to tell me that he was going to pray for me, if he'd kept his mouth shut, the hand on the shoulder, the hand on the shoulder, the look, the look in his eyes that he could, he, that he could feel the pain that I'm feeling. That's what we need. You know, that's, just show that you care, you know, and have some respect for the feeling for, for what we're going through, for the humanity of it, and and keep all that other bullshit to yourself because that's just going to go south in a hurry. So, a couple days ago, I'm at this rehab center and I'm I'm, I'm visiting her and 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 un unusually she's not in the bed where i expect to find her she's not in her room they've they've moved, wheeled her out to a bible study in the main lobby and 
I tell you sincerely, I could not believe what I was, what I, what I heard when I walked in there. There's some young guy preaching to all of these people in wheelchairs, talking about how many pearls are in the pearly gates. As if anyone could know such a thing and, and, and just, say it as if as if they're right as if it's demonstrably true oh you can look it up there's exactly this many pearls in the pearl gate the fuck are you doing how is that of any value to anyone i don't i i, I as an unbeliever I, I i don't get any jollies out of fantasy i i can't see it myself and so i admit there is a distinct possibility that i can on occasion be an ass. And that happened to me today. I went in to visit and the, the expectations that I had been given up to now was that recovery was slow, but it was going to happen. And she, she will walk again and she will be, she will be able to go back to her own original living, her cat and her, all of that, that sort of thing. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm close by, if there's a problem, I can, I can be there in a moment, but, um, it, but it, it'll go, it'll go back to the way it was. And, and now the expectations are different. Now, now that what I'm being told, it, 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 what is being implied subtly, and don't have any verification of this yet, what is being subtly implied is that maybe she's never coming home again. She's going to be in a situation similar to this and maybe exactly like this possibly for years however that's going to be financed or whatever that's i don't know anything about how we do any of that so i'm already on edge you know with this kind of information she's never going to walk she's never going to be able to talk the way she used to that she's never going to be able to she's not she's she's already not her anymore and possibly never will be that she's always going to be a percentage of the person she used to be mentally and physically. So I'm already on edge. And she sent me out to get nurses to help her with something. Cause now, I mean, she, she would, she would say that she wants to go home and I'm like, well, how you, can you go home? I mean, you, you, you can't even do puppy tricks. You can't sit up or roll over or stand. That, that, that's a problem. You, you, you can't be independent when you have to have two large people help you sit up in bed or go to the bathroom. There's certain harsh realities involved there. So I walk in and I'm going to advise her that I've, I've, I've notified the nurses. We're going to get a couple of nurses in to help her with what she needs. And there's somebody in there. And I think, OK, well, are, are you one of the nurses that I'm waiting for? And I get, no, I'm the chaplain. I'm just here to help her pray. When you say, oh, heavenly father, blah, 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 blah. I tell you sincerely, what I hear is starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight. What, what the hell is the difference? You're doing exactly the same thing. How is this somebody's job? This is your job? You professionally wish upon a star? Now, I realize that some people get that placebo effect that have really bought into this and they really think it's real. I get some people are like that, but um, yeah, not me. And I tried to stay out of it. I tried to stay cool about it. And then she said she was going to pray for me. And I said, uh, I said, I'm on the board of directors of American atheists. Uh, it's not going to do me any good. So let's just not. And then she starts in again. Oh, well, you, you don't understand. Is God loves you and God created you. And I'm like, um, there is no God. And I made that clear. She should know. We are not going here. And then she said, oh, yes, there definitely is a God. And he created you and he loves you. And I, I'm like, I know there is no God. And then, of course, I'm, I'm told that, that I need to calm down. And I wasn't, I wasn't harsh or anything. There is no God on my side. And I say, hey, 
if she's going to stand there and lie to me, pretending to know shit she doesn't know, talking out of her ass, I am definitely going to respond by telling her things I do know that I can show to be true. Why is it that when somebody comes up to you or, or to a child in the street and tells them some lie like this, why is the liar praised as if they've done something nice? But if you tell the truth, you're the bad guy. And so all I did, and I, I felt like apologizing. I actually called somebody at the hospital and said, hey, I'm sorry. I, I should have contained myself, but she pushed. She pressed. And I'm not playing. So, yeah, I, I, I didn't raise my voice. It wasn't anything like that. But, I, but let me tell you, I was stern. I don't, I don't envy hospital chaplains that they have a, a, a rise in the population of atheists. And there's, there's just certain things you need not say to me, especially, and, and don't tell me after you've already argued with me like she did. You know, she then consoles her and, and says, oh, she, she, she's making her feel better because she's now confronted me and we've had this, this exchange. She says, oh, I don't argue. I don't argue. I'm like, the fuck was all this stuff about, oh, yes, God really does love you. Was that not arguing? I just told you. And my wife, I came home and I told my wife about this. And she said that, you know what, you should just learn to say good day. Because then when they push, you get the opportunity to say what you've always wanted to say. I said good day, sir. That would have been a much better way to handle that. Better than I did. Well, I don't think I have anything more to share on that. I just had to share that I, I don't know if anybody is like-minded in this instance but um this that how, that's how i feel i just wanted to share it. goodbye